All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about something called language semantics. Think of this sort of like grammar, right? The grammar rules that we have to follow in the English language when we write and speak help us make sure that communication of information passes seamlessly from one person to another. And the same thing has to happen with programming. You have to have certain semantics or rules for typing up the language that everyone agrees to or you get miscommunications, right? So um, if you've done this in other languages, uh, Python's gonna be a little bit different, right? For example, maybe you've done some Arduino projects. Hopefully you have. Arduino is a wonderful tool for doing really rapid prototyping and building things really quickly and easily. And if you've done that, you've noticed, right, when you do this, you have to start out by, before you ever dive into your code where you actually make things happen, you have to declare all your variables. All the variables that you're going to use, you have to declare them up front. We have to say what type it is, in this case, int. That corresponds to a certain type of integer. You have to put the semicolon at the end of each statement, otherwise it'll give you an error, right? So there's these specific rules. And then you have to do this, like you have to set up, uh, you have to declare which pins on your Arduino board are going to be active. So you have to say this one's going to be an output, this one's going to be an input, all this stuff. And then when you get into the code, it, it, there's other complications, right? There's something called an if statement, for example. An if statement says, if a condition is met, then do this. And you could say, if it's not met, then do something else, right? So in this case, they say, if button state, that's a variable, is equal to high, right? That's some value that the variable can be. Then they put this curly bracket, right? That curly bracket right there, and that goes all the way down to here. And inside these curly brackets, right? Inside that region is the stuff that happens if that condition is met. So one of the first differences you'll notice with Python is that we don't have to rely on these curly brackets. Instead, what we use is indentations, right? So for example, take a look here. Here, uh, they use white space, they call it. They use spaces. The default is four spaces, right? That's one tab. That's used to denote blocks of code. So if we come over here, I'm going to close our, our, our Arduino. If we come over to Spider, I could write a um, block of code in the same way. I could say that you've got your variable, let's just call it x, and we've got our variable y, right? And y is going to be equal to 8 or 9, right? Now here we're going to say if y is greater than x, and I'm going to do colon, that says that it's starting our if statement, right? Um, now we're going to say, I just hit enter, and notice what it already did. It already put those four white spaces over here for me. But now we can say what should happen. So we're going to print, right? Now, print doesn't have to be capitalized, right? This is a special word. If I capitalize print, it won't work, right? It's not going to be the same way. So we need to do lowercase print. Now it shows up in orange, so you know it's a special word, right? Now we're going to have it print something. We'll say, like, um, y is greater than x, right? That's the text that will be printed out. So let's go ahead and run this. We're going to hit F5, right? And when it runs, sure enough, the output over here is a y is greater than x. And if we look at our variable explorer over here, we see that x is equal to a value of 5, y is equal to a value of 9. Everything's great, right? When we're done with this, if we wanted other things to happen, we could have other things happen. We could say that z is now equal to you know x plus y, right? You could have that happen. Now, if we're done with our if statement and we want to keep on coding, but not inside of that if conditional statement, now notice that the white space is gone. So if I have like my dog and I want to name my dog something like Scout, um, it's not inside this. Um, I haven't tabbed over, so it's not part of that statement that was above. Okay. So what else can we say about these? Um, you don't need a semicolon to finish your statement, but you can use semicolons if you want to put multiple on the same line. Like here, they name three students. Student one is named Tom, then they use a semicolon, and then student two is Nick, student three is Krish. And because they put these all in the same line, they did semicolons to separate them. But if you notice in our code, we didn't use semicolons when we declared these different variables. All right, you don't have to in Python, which is nice. Okay, what else? Um, you can comment out sections of your code by putting this hash, right, or the pound sign in front of that line, okay? Or you can highlight a section of your code and hit control one and it will toggle that whole section on and off in terms of being a comment. So for example, if you decide that you don't like this if statement, right, I can just highlight it and then hit control one and see what it did. It put pound signs in front of them and the text turned gray. And if we run it now, let's run our code again. This time when we run it, it didn't output any text, right? It didn't tell us that y is greater than x because it's been commented out. Basically, the, the compiler or the interpreter, when it comes across those lines, it just skips them. It, it ignores them, right? And if you decide that you want those back again, you highlight them and then control one. So that's just some handy stuff that Python makes available for us. Or on a, in, any individual line, right? You can manually type in that pound sign and it'll get rid of it, right? Um, here's something that's cool. You can have functions in this language 
And so, for example, maybe you don't want to type out the mathematical expression to solve for the quadratic formula every single time. What if you just did it once and then you could call that every time and just send it the values of a, b, and c and it will send back the values of your roots, right? That would be an example of a function. Well, to do that in Python, and we'll learn about these later, um, you just have to build your function and then you send it with round brackets the values that you're going to send to your function, right? Um, here's another thing. When you uh, name your variables in Python, what it does is it creates an object to represent that data, right? So for example, so my dog's name is Scout. If we say that your dog, right, a new variable is equal to dog, then it's going to name it the same thing as Scout, okay? In other words, naming a variable creates a reference to the object being named. It does not create or recreate that object, right? So for example, when I took my restaurant was equal to red iguana over here, and I say that name equals restaurant in the next line, the date, the data under red iguana didn't necessarily get copied. We just have the variables restaurant and name both pointing at the same data, right? So more on that later when we talk about um, the importance of copying data over if you don't want to destroy the original, right? Now, variables can be different types and they can change different types, right? In our Arduino, remember when we declared like a port, it was an integer. And then if we wanted to use that port as a string later on, that was going to give us a problem. You couldn't use it as a text, right? But that's not a problem in Python, right? If I currently say that restaurant equals red iguana, that's a string of text. And then I say that name is equal to restaurant. And then I say that restaurant is equal to 500. I've changed type from a string of text to now a numeric value. No big deal. That's not a problem in Python, okay? All right. And then over here, uh, let's talk about this. Variables have lots of attributes and methods. We will talk about more of these later. Think of attributes like things um, like things that you could use to describe the type of data that's there. For example, if you have a list of data, if your variable is a list of data, then that data would be iterable. You could iterate through it. So that would be an attribute, right? If you had a single value, you can't iterate through a single value. It's just a single value. Right, but a list you could, so that's an attribute. And then a method, think of methods as things that you can do to modify uh, your, your data in the, that's stored in that variable. For example, let's come back over here and we'll go to, um, so in my variable for dog, it is a string of text. And so because it's a string of text, it will have specific attributes associated with strings. If I hit dog and then I hit tab, it's gonna bring up lots of options for things that are methods that I can apply to it. For example, I could do capitalize, right? And what it's going to do is it's going to capitalize the word if it wasn't capitalized. Or I could do I could do upper. All right, let's try upper. What does upper do? So we're going to make a new variable, new dog, right, is equal to dog, our previous variable, with this method applied to it, upper. So let's see what happens when we run it. When we run that new dog, see what it did? The previous dog was named Scout, and the S was capitalized because that's her name, but this time it capitalized everything. So the upper function must automatically go through and change all your variables from lowercase to uppercase, right? So that's an example of a method. Those become really useful because a lot of these things would be painstaking to type out by hand to make those changes manually, but we have methods that make it really easy for them to do for us, okay? So those are methods. Um, there's something called duck typing, which is kind of interesting. And when you're working with different variables of different types, like maybe one's a list and one's a number and one's a, you know, whatever, different types, um, duck typing comes from the phrase, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Or in other words, you don't have to necessarily know exactly what type of variable it is, as long as if they share a certain attribute, then you can make them do something together, like if they're iterable, for example. Um, more on that later. Then uh, the last thing I want to say before we move on from this video is that you can do something cool called um, importing modules in Python. So what's a module? Over here, we've been typing this in the temporary.py, temp.py file. So if I was to save this, let's say that I built like a really cool function in here for the quadratic function. And then every time I, I'm going to do math, I don't want to remember uh, to build that function again. What's great is I can import this whole temp.py, right? So in your code, uh, here's an example of it. Here I did an example of a function that take, it's, I called it student name, and it's inside the module name underscore joiner.py, right? And what it does is if you give it a first and a last name, it will put them together with a space between, right? Now that's a, a simple one, but you can imagine more complicated mo functions that you wouldn't want to recreate every time. Now in another module, I can import name underscore joiner, which again, that was the name of this previous module. And now I have this function available, student underscore name, here it is. So I can say some new name, I'm gonna call the name joiner module, right? And then 
dot student name. That's the function, and I can send it the two names, and it will put them together to give the full name. So that's a trivial example, but those become really useful later on. And then lastly, I just put a link here to some really useful, it's a reference cheat sheet. So if you need to remember the syntax for how you multiply something or how you um, comment something out or whatever, this has a really good cheat sheet for lots of the Python 3 commands that you're going to run into. So with that said, I think we're now ready to move from semantics to now our very first uh, Python section, which is going to be talking about data types. We'll see that in the next video.